last time then we we talked about uh, the cantos of pride uh, we introduced the cantos of pride 10 11 12 and the I was I was arguing that Dante comes to know and understand the virtues and vices of pride and its opposite humility, which is his feature, humility is his feature in Canto 10, and pride he'll see punished in Canto 12. Uh, he'll get to understand the nature of this uh, uh, virtue and this, and this vice by looking at the work of art. So that in Canto 10, we already have a sort of representation of what of what an aesthetic education can turn out to be. What how do we look at art and what are we likely to learn from it? This was the argument. Dante arrives into purgatory proper. And the first image that he uses to give us a sense of the dimensions of this place is the figure of the human measure. Uh, he measures the world around him through the uh, dimensions of uh, the human figure. Uh, and so obliquely, it's not, in, it's not uh, quite, uh, we are not quite there yet at that point, but he's warning us that indeed the issue is what is. The issue about pride and about humility uh, really is what is man's measure. Uh, we are, he says that, he is gonna, that the, the place is measured according to the size of uh, human beings. But then the question is, what is the measure uh, of human beings in a moral sense, of course? Since pride is of superbia in Italian and in Latin, is a, a sin of um, uh, excessive, excessive, uh, um, love of one's own excellence. The sense that one isn't quite reducible to what perhaps others see about us. The idea that there may be a touch of vanity in the way we judge and view ourselves, the way in which we, we, we measure ourselves. Humility, on the other hand, is the opposite, uh, is, is the remedy to, to pride. And it is really a virtue in that it really reduces us to, reminds us of the fact that we are earthbound. That's the meaning of the word. And by the way, that's exactly how humility and the etymology of human are connected. Uh, they, both, they both derive from a common root, a common matrix in humus, which is the Latin word for the earth. Uh, we, are, we are called humans, homo, because we come out of the earth, because we are, we are made of the clay of the earth and we return to the earth. That's the, the, the other implication. On the other hand, humility is the virtue that reminds us that we really should not view of ourselves as all that elevated. So these are the issues. Measure, uh, and Dante then confronts some scenes of uh, humility. He begins with the virtues. And the scenes of humility are, seen, are, are the virtue of humility are, are all taken from the three histories that interest him. He is always placing himself at the confluence of these three strains of, uh, of history. Uh, an image from the Old Testament, David, who dances in front of the ark. Therefore, he humiliates himself. He tells us that he's more and less than king. And by the way, this phrase, more and less, this lack of precision, uh, is really an expression that pervades Canto 10. Yeah, this is more and less. The grief is more than I can take, etc. Uh, appears in uh, a variety of forms at least five times in, in the context of this, uh, of the Canto. Next to David, in that image of humility from the Old Testament, uh, and above him, actually, watching down from the balcony of, of uh, uh, a high tower in the royal palace, there is his wife, Michal, who looks down at David. Not only he looks, she looks down at David, she obviously has contempt for him because, in her view, he is 
uh, humiliating. He's offending, violating the principle of the decorum of what a king ought to be. She has a different understanding of what is the measure of a king and the place of a king. Because pride is exactly a question of place. What place do I, do I occupy in the world around me? Am I where I think I would like to be? Or am I where somebody else is placing me through his, her gaze? The second image is an image of, but they're all, of the way, you, 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 you notice the little detail. They're all placed above. They're sculptures placed above the, 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 the normal site so that there is an obvious reversal now in what the value of humility can be. There is uh, the story of the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel who descends, literally, and that descent is a story of humiliation uh, of the divine. The divine enters uh, history, and therefore, in that sense, the divine is truly omnipotent. There is uh, the idea, which is really something developed. I, I, I prepared it. I, I mentioned it here, but we'll come back to that. The idea that the divine is detached from the human would make the divine less omniscient. A divine that does not know the human, does not know death, cannot can claim to be omniscient. That's an argument that Dante uses. The, so there is a story of the angel Gabriel who comes down and uh, the obedience of Mary, the Virgin Mary, who says, yes, I am your servant. So there's a story of, uh, and Mary is the one who is said to turn the key uh, between the old, uh, the old uh, alliance and the new alliance. She reverses the story of Eve. It is as if her obedience is a response to uh, some kind of violation and the promise of being divine in uh, the eating of the tree. The third uh, example uh, story that the pilgrim sees, uh, looks at, is the story of the Emperor Trajan, secular history, who stops his, uh, his, uh, from, from marching on to his campaign into Dacia, into Romania, in order to give uh, justice to a little widow, the diminutive is Dantes, a little widow who has been asking for uh, justice before he departs, justice for the death of her son. This is what he, what Dante is confronted with. And when he's confronted with this, we do know that he's being asked and directed by Virgil to look uh, at the whole scene, not to stop at one detail, to even move beyond uh, Virgil himself in what would appear to be a transgression of the reverential bond that ties them. He, Dante, is always following, as a, a disciple follows the, the teacher, so he just even transgresses his place, but that doesn't seem to, to have anything to do with the aesthetic education of the pilgrim. He's witnessing what he calls visible speech, uh, a, a synesthesia. That's what the phrase is, visibile parlare in Italian. Visible speech is a synesthesia that combines the, the se two sensory uh, experiences, uh, the eye and, 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 and the hearing, so speech, uh, because this is God's art. And God's art has also a precise meaning, a precise meaning that Dante has no difficulty understanding or finding delight in. Okay, so this is uh, the, the argument. At one point, the, in the drama of the canto, uh, some figures keep appearing and Virgil directs Dante's eyes toward the people that are appearing. Dante does not recognize them. He says, I don't know what they are. Uh, my sight is so confused. He doesn't want to even know who they are, what they are. Virgil will explain to him, are uh, human figures crawling on the huge boulders and almost moving like on the ground, on the, on, the, on the earth, like worms on the earth. And Dante is not really uh, capable of uh, deciphering them or having even sympathy with them. At that point, as you recall, because I, I had the feeling that maybe the explanation is a little bit, was a little bit too uh, wriggly, but Dante's poem, uh, Canto moves in that way, a little, with a lot of sinuosities there. I mentioned to you a particular passage in chapter two, book three, chapter two of the Confessions. It's an extraordinary passage, and I brought it in so that you can, you can uh, I, I want to read a little bit from, uh, uh, from that. Uh, it's, a can it's a passage, it's a, it's, it's a book where, um, um, Augustine is living in Carthage. Uh, you know that this is about now, at this stage, is about 17, 
uh, 19 has been talking about his attraction for um, shows, uh, uh, his attractions for the Manichaeans, uh, uh, the distaste for scripture that he has, and how he is going to be, has been uh, led, led, led astray by uh, some of his friends with the stealing of uh, gratuitous, stealing of the pear tree, the pears from the pear tree, which said she doesn't understand why he would ever do that. And now, uh, he talks about, uh, once again, his experience of the theater. That is to say, he's discussing his experience of himself as a spectator, which is exactly what Dante was. Dante, the, the, the problem of da Dante in Canto 10 of Purgatorio is that he is at first a spectator of works of art, which he seems to have no difficulty understanding. Then he has to be involved, show some, at least some compassion some self-recognition with his souls who are this, the shades, penitents who are under this huge uh, weights that they carry, and he cannot do it. He cannot do that. He still has to learn what grief is and what is it and how do you go on connecting to the images that you see. Let's see how, what Augustine says. Augustine, um, is, that's what he says, stage plays, this is really, Chapter uh, two of book three. Stage plays carried me away, full of images of my miseries and of fuel to my fire. Why is it that men desires to be made sad, beholding doleful and tragical things, which yet himself would by no means suffer? The real pleasure of his going to the theater, he claims, we have a great pleasure, is in the images of grief that don't really touch us. We are not even expected to jump on the stage to relieve the characters who are involved in this, in this sort of situation. So he goes on and then you, you see what uh, the point is, which of himself would by no means suffer. Yet he desires as a spectator to feel sorrow at them. And this very sorrow is his pleasure. I was just paraphrasing that. What is this but a miserable madness? For a man is the more affected with his actions, the less free he is from such affections. However, when he suffers in his own person, it uses to be styled misery. When he compassionates others, then it is mercy. But what sort of compassion is this for feigned and scenic passions? For the auditor is not called on to relieve, but only to grieve. And he applauds the actor of these fictions the more the more he grieves. And if the calamities of those persons were of old times or mere fiction, be so acted that the spectator is not moved to tears, he goes away disgusted and criticizing. But if he is to be moved to passion, he stays intent and weeps for joy. This is an extraordinary passage, I think, in the history of, uh, of antiquity and the, the, the criticism of the theater, dramatic theater. And the point is, can we ever be disengaged Spectators. Yes, we can be disengaged spectators, and Augustine is criticizing the disengaged spectators. The belief that we can be in front of the play of the world and that things only touch us as if in a fiction, and yet we ourselves are not going to be able to acknowledge it. He's really criticizing the limits of the theater, the limits of that kind of, 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 of uh, uh, aesthetic experience. I think that Dante is picking up exactly from this, uh, what, what Augustine says in this chapter. And he's, he's showing how unavoidably one has to be involved. There's not, in the measure in which we think that we are not touched by somebody else's grief, we're really admitting the overpowering quality of that experience. That's his argument. So he has learned something then. He has learned that there is no such a thing as a safe perspective. The way, uh, and he has learned what, what uh, Michal had been doing in, uh, in, uh, from the high wind of her palace. That she was expressing uh, uh, disgust at, her, at her, her, her husband because that offends her own sense of superiority. And Dante says, I may be no different from Michal in my disclaimer that I do not know and I do not see 
any of, of any of uh, this this penitents who disfigure the human form in refusing to acknowledge that they are like me in refusing to to have any self recognition between me and them so this is really the aesthetic education let's see now what Dante uh, how Dante is aesthetic and it's ethical he goes on understanding that the stakes here are in uh, uh, the idea of perspective the idea that the world is uh, a projection of uh, my own wishes on that world is is really re uh, reformulated uh, I am uh, if I think that I can take a safe distance because I do not want to look within myself Canto 11 and Canto 12, I think, will answer that question. So let me just go on with Canto 12, uh, Canto 11, I'm sorry, first of all. Uh, and if there are questions, you can interrupt me because I, you know, I, I, I don't think this is a difficult argument, but uh, if there are questions, interrupt me now or uh, keep them for later. Um, Canto 11 begins with the penitents who now change, reverse perspective. They are so close to the ground, but they are looking up. They are looking up and they have the Lord's Prayer in what is Dante's own uh, recasting of uh, the canonical uh, prayer. Uh, Our Father, that's which are in heaven, not circumscribed, but by thy great love thou hast for thy first works on high. This is the prayer of the penitents. Praised be thy name and power by every creature. As it is meet to give thanks for the sweet effluence. May thy peace of thy kingdom come to us, for we cannot reach it of ourselves if it come not with all our striving. As thine angels make sacrifice to thee of their will, singing hosannas, so let men make of theirs. Give us this day the daily manna without which he goes backward through this harsh wilderness who most labors to advance. And as we forgive everyone the wrong we have suffered, do thou also forgive in loving kindness and look not on our deserving our strengths and so on. Uh, the thus beseeching would speed for themselves and for us the shades when beneath their burden, uh, etc. Uh, the, the, what about this, uh, this prayer? First of all, uh, um, how is this related to what we are talking about? The first thing is that the, in the Lord's Prayer, when the change Dante makes is to emphasize that God is not in space, that not circumscribed, right? God is not in space, and therefore he is really uh, everywhere, or he's free. The, the formula that he's using, you may want to know, is a traditional one in uh, medieval, medieval thinking, whereby God is said to be an infinite sphere. This is a, defor a formula to define what, what the idea of the infinity of God. An infinite sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference nowhere. God is not in a place. God doesn't have a perspective. So it's a, there is, in, indirectly, there is a critique of perspective here, or the inadequacy of a perspective. God is everywhere, not circumscribed. That's the first change. The second change that he's making, this is a Neoplatonic element that he adds on to the Lord's Prayer. And then the second one is that he literally places, give us this day, the daily manna, uh, without which he goes backwards. He, def he literally uh, makes the Lord's Prayer, the prayer of the exiles in the desert, like the Jews in the wilderness who ask and get their manna. So now this is uh, uh, another element, that, that another metaphorical uh, element that uh, casts purgatory as a journey through the desert uh, between the bondage of Egypt and, uh, and, uh, and Jerusalem. So the other point is uh, that there is uh, a reversal of perspective somehow. Uh, and what kind of perspective is he gaining now? Uh, the perspective, I think, is what I call a Franciscan perspective. Let me just explain, first of all, the line, let Thy name, praised be thy name and power of every creature. This is literally an echo of the first poem of the Italian poetic tradition, a poem written by St. Francis, which is known as the Canticle of Creatures, which is really a sequence, an anaphoric sequence of praises. Praised be thy name, praised be the water, praised so on. But the point of that poem is that it begins with the look of human beings up to the highest 
and then it ends up with the idea of humility. We are, as Francis says, not the most important or the center, the center of creation. We are, like everything else, valuable in creation. That's the, 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 the thrust of the poem. And the only way in which you can really understand creation is really to look from the bottom up and not from the top down. This is the true, the, the kind of pers uh, perspective that he is uh, uh, describing in the poem. The rest of the canto really is a connection uh, between art and pride, which we are not going to be surprised since the whole of Canto 10 was a reflection on the premises of, that, of, that, of, of the two metaphors, art and pride. So you have uh, uh, the, the illuminators and then uh, references uh, on, on lines 90 to the painters, oh, empty glory of human powers, how briefly lasts the green on its top, unless it's followed by an age of dullness. In painting, Cimabue thought to hold the field, and now Giotto has the crow, cry, so that the other's fame is dim. And so, and then the p poets, uh, Guido Cavalcanti and Guido Winizelli, so has the one Guido taken from the other the glory of our tongue, and he perhaps is born that shall chase the one and the other from the nest, meaning uh, Dante himself. The idea of fame, which is what the proud souls may be looking for, is here dismissed as uh, uh, having the inconsistency of, uh, of the wind, just vanishing uh, like the breath, uh, a breath of wind. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is the, the sort of moral understanding of uh, of, of, uh, of pride and humility. And in Canto 12, I just want to show you and describe the reasons why, and, and try to explain to you the reasons why Dante deploys a peculiar uh, rhetorical artifice. And I ask you to uh, turn to around lines 25, which is a sequence of new visions Dante has. This time these images are on the ground, so he has to look down, doesn't have to look up. And they're images of the proud souls who have been punished. And therefore, now they appear now on the ground. And the text starts, I saw him that was created nobler than any other creature. Now, of course, you know who he is, uh, as on the side. I saw Briareus, one of the giants, pierced by the heavenly shaft, lying heavy. I saw Timbreus, I saw Pallas, and then I saw Nimrod. All figures you have more or less. Uh, seen before at the foot of his mighty work as if bewildered and he was looking at the people's in uh, Shinar the shared, uh, and sh that shared his pride. And then uh, four tercets, O Niobe, next O Saul, O Medarachne, O Rehoboam. And then once again the four more uh, tercets, it showed to the hard pavement uh, Archmeon, it showed how he fell upon Sennacherib, it showed the destruction uh, and the cruel butchery that Tomiris wrought, it showed how the Assyrians fled in rout after Holofernes were slain, and then one final uh, tercet, I saw, I saw Troy in ashes and in heaps, O Ilion, how abased and vile the design showed thee that we saw there. This is, so they're all the figurations of punished. Uh, pride, uh, pride that has been now literally humiliated. But I did have to ask you to look so that you can understand the artifice. This is what we call a visible speech that Dante himself has been deploying. And to do this, I have to ask you to look at the Italian text that begins with the word, every tercet with the letter V, V, Vedea, you don't have to read the whole thing, Vedea Briareo, though you, I'm sure you would like me to read a little bit of the Italian. Vedea colui che fu nobil creato, the next tercet, Vedea Briareo, the next, Vedea Timbreo, Vedea Nembrot. And then the four next tercets with the word, with the O, or the letter O, Niobe, O Saul, O Folle Aragne, O Roboam, and then the next four tercets with M, Mostrava ancora, Mostrava come i figli si gettaro, Next, mostrava la ruina. You gotta read down, okay? 
uh, Mostrava come in rota and the final the Thursday from line 61 to 62 Vedea Troia o Ilion Mostrava which sort of recapitulates all of uh, the key elements of this artifice. We are in the presence of uh, a so-called acrostic that if you read from the top down, it spells the following. And then recapitulates. This is the V, but in Italian it's also the U. That is to say, the fall of man. So he's doing this, he's using this artifice that you can only understand if you read the text. You, if you have to hear it, you, you can't quite get to it. In other words, he's doing two things. Using God's own art as a model for himself. Now, this is pride. Huh? You wouldn't seem to be pride. After all, it's excessive love of one's excellence. But God did that in Canto 10. He's going to do the same thing <coughs> now with the text. The second thing that it shows is that the text is not a text to be just heard. It's a text to be read. It's a text to be looked at. It's what we call visible speech. And so what is Dante doing? In, uh, is he lapsing into the scene of pride? Yes, of course, but what he's telling us is that pride is not a sin. He is, in a sense, redefining the ethical language of the Middle Ages and the ethical language of his own text. He's saying that in the measure in which you love what is above you, that is not a sin. The sin, it is a sin, pride, in the measure in which you do have contempt for those that you think are below you. So we have, thanks to the world of art, a reevaluation of the moral language. That's the first and most important example of all of this that happens throughout purgatory in purgatory itself. Do you see what is it? You want me to say this again? Uh, Dante, uh, by imitating God's form of art, as he does here, with his own text, he said he's drawing attention that to this is an artifice available to us thanks to his text. And it's only possible to view it the way he describes it, describes it within the text. So he's giving a peculiar status to his own text. This text has also its stages and artifice that we normally, and he has learned from God directly. Which means that uh, the sin of Lucifer even, it's not just the sin that he transgresses what's above him, it's the sin because he has contempt for what is below him. So that humility and pride really have to go hand in hand and one attenuates and changes the meaning of the other. Um, Okay, this is really something that in many ways Franciscan, the Franciscan cantor, you might want to write a paper on that, on, on the song of the so-called, the song of all creatures by St. Francis and this particular cantor and, and see you may draw your own conclusions if you do not agree with uh, what I have said. Let's move on to uh, the next few cantos. Uh, I want to go to, above all, to Canto 16, um, um, because here we have, uh, we are approaching now the center of the world of purgatory. We are in the, we skip envy altogether, and I will, do it, I will get back to that uh, on an, an another, an another occasion in Canto 15. Um, but 16 and 17, we'll talk about anger, the sin of anger, uh, the purgation of anger. Here in 16, Dante, uh, meets uh, a, a famous, magnanimous uh, figure called Marco Lombardo. And he has a discussion about human, who has a discussion with him about the so-called the issue of human degradation, human degeneracy. Um, it's, uh, the scene takes place in a kind of uh, the cloud of anger, the biblical cloud of anger sort of a world deprived of any light, a kind of madness, if you wish. Anger understood as that which violates the clarity and light of reason, uh, that as, as we refer to it. Gloom of hell or night bereft of every planet under a barren sky overcast everywhere with cloud, never made a veil to my sight so heavy or of a stuff so harsh to the sense 
as the smoke. And then the language of justice, a blind man goes behind his guide that he may not stray or knock against what he may injure and perhaps kill him. So I went through the foul and bitter air listening to my leader. So he meets then in this, within this context, in this background of, uh, of, of uh, uh, cloudiness and near blindness, near invisibility of the world around him, a kind of invisibility that has been carried over from the sin of envy, which as you know, was, it's all about, uh, about being blind. Uh, then he hears a voice and uh, Dante asks, uh, 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 the, the one, one question. Uh, the question is, uh, do we have, uh, uh, the world is wholly barren of uh, every virtue around line 55, uh, as thou declares to me, and pregnant and overspread with wi wi wickedness, but I beg thee to point out to me the cause that I may see it, and how is to man for one place is it in the heavens and another here below. Is there such a thing as free, what we call free will? What is it? Uh, what is free will? Uh, what is the cause of all our uh, deeds, uh, of our doings? Is it in, uh, as the astrologers would say, in the planets, and therefore a matter of determination by forces that transcend us and on which we have no control? So there are a, a, a severe limitation of uh, uh, the meaning of choices and the possibilities of choices, and therefore of merits and the merits. If we have no choices, then we can really, we cannot be praised or blamed for what we do. Or is it within us? And this is Marco Lombardo. It's a, it's, it is a revisit. Dante is revisiting the whole story of a debate, an ancient debate about the relationship between free will and God's foreknowledge, if you wish, that Boethius in the Consolation of Philosophy uh, as is well known, had been confronting. He first heaved then a deep sigh, line 63 and following, which grief forced to alas, then began, brother, um, I don't have to point out to you, this is the form of salutation in purgatory, right? You already had our father uh, in Canto 11 with this idea that there's a human family, that we, we, we therefore a brother is the, the appropriate uh, form of interlocution and address among uh, the souls and Dante. The world is blind and I indeed, I indeed thou comest from it. You that are living, refer every cause up to the heavens alone, just as if they moved all things with them by necessity. If it were so, free choice would be destroyed. I think the text is very clear. I would have to tell you that there is a distinction between choice and free will. They are not the same thing, free choice of free will. And this is a very uh, difficult argument. Choice implies that we, <coughs> that it's an intellectual problem, that we choose uh, thanks to what we know. Uh, the will is a, a, a difficult argument because free will implies that the will is never in bondage and it's possible to attain the moment where we will freely. In fact, so many theologians were on asking that free will means that the will finally can be moved by an act of choice, that it, is, it, is, it, it follows on the prior uh, act of knowledge. Uh, okay, so Dante uses the two terms. Um, if it were so, free choice would be destroyed in you and there would be no justice in happiness for well-doing and misery for evil. And so that's the answer that the, the Marco Lombardo will give. The heavens initiate your impulses. I do not say all, but if I did, light is given on good and evil and free will. And if it bear the, the strain in the first battlings with the heavens, then being rightly nurtured, it conquers all. To a greater power and to a better nature, you free our subject, which in Italian re really is, uh, I have to say, more of an oxymoron, liberi, line 80, liberi, so just you are free subjects, exactly. You are, and, 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 and you, you, you can, you do sense the, you understand the contradiction uh, in the two terms. So that is to say, uh, we are free, but at the same time, we are subject. I, I can only understand it with, in terms of what Dante will say a little bit later when he discusses, he, he shifts the argument to the law, saying that that's really the, uh, we are uh, free subjects and the law is exactly the, the, the metaphor for him that would 
make us understand what it means to be free and subject at the same time, where limitations are going to be posited and within those limitations we, we can be free. That's the argument. And that creates the mind in which the heavens have no in charge, therefore, etc. And then here, the first thing that Dante does is give a sense of creation. He posits human freedom in the uh, act of creation of the soul. And this is, look, this is from his hand, lines 85. From his hand, who regards it fondly before it is, comes forth like a child that sports, tearful and smiling, the little simple soul that knows nothing. This is the famous poem, for those of you who remember a little bit of Latin, Hadrian, of the Emperor Hadrian, about the, uh, the little simple soul oh, that goes wandering around. And Dante is reinterpreting it as, as not the soul that is lost in the world, but a soul that is playing. Uh, the creation is a playful act. The soul is, is like a child that sports, tearful and smile, the little simple soul that knows nothing but moved by joyful maker turns eagerly to what delights it. We have the idea of creation as a free and playful act. Play in the sense of the innocence of the, of the experience and play in the sense of being free. Now, when one is at play, one has, a, has all the attributes of spontaneity and freedom that go with it. It is the basis of what I call the playful theology of Dante. Uh, God creates the world in an act, in, an, in, uh, in a moment of freedom. And that freedom becomes the foundation for positing our own human freedom. Uh, it's, it's because we, we, we were born free that therefore we can go on uh, believing and uh, that there is uh, such a freedom for us. There was not an act of necessity that would be the opposite in the moment of creation, in the experience of creation, but it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's spontaneous and playful. And then the canto goes on with uh, this extraordinary political argument, political legal argument. So we talk about human freedom and that then pass, it moves to political freedom. And look at what he says, Rome, which made the good world, used to have two sons, which is a kind of Baroque image, and I'll explain that too in a moment why he uses this image, which made plain the one way and the other, that of the world and that of God. The one has quenched the other, and the sword is joined to the crook, and the one together with the other must perforce go ill, since joined the one does not fear the other. If thou dost not believe me, consider the ear of corn, uh, etc. What is he talking about with God has, um, Rome had two sons? Uh, the phrase translates, a line mistranslates, deliberately mistranslates, a line in Genesis, where it is said that God gave mankind two luminaries, the sun and the moon, but whereby we could really see both in the day and at night. This little image from Genesis was used by the so-called hierocrats, of the, 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 the canon lawyers of the Middle Ages, to explain it as the emblem for the empire and the church, that the, the empire, the sun having the larger light, the hierocrats would claim, was the light of the church, and the moon having a reflected light uh, was the light of the empire. It was an argument, they would use this, uh, this, this gloss as a way of explaining the superiority of the empire over, uh, I'm sorry, the superiority of the church over the empire. The empire had to take its light and its direction from the church. Dante is deliberately violating that idea of the sun and the moon, equating them by saying the two suns in order to convey his conviction, the conviction that the two institutions God provides for the guidance of human beings, the church and the empire, are equal. He's conferring on them an equality uh, rather than a hierarchical ordering uh, of uh, the two luminaries, the, the, the sun and the moon. It's an argument that really is addressed against the, the, the lawyers at the, at, the, at the University of Bologna uh, where they, are, they, they, they were working for 
for the Pope explaining the sense of uh, uh, the, the, the superiority, the, su the superior uh, status of one above, uh, above the other. And, uh, and so with this uh, uh, whole argument here now, uh, the, the which is about uh, uh, kind of legality or uh, the, the questions of uh, history's boundaries, that's what I understand by legalities, you have retrospectively also some light shown on this claim of uh, being free subjects in, uh, in Canto uh, 16. And we turn now to the very center of uh, the, the Divine Comedy, the center of the Divine Comedy, which is clearly numerically the center, Canto 17, and we'll see uh, how, what, what is that Dante discusses here. Uh, in Canto 17, uh, the Canto, it's visions of anger. Uh, uh, the, the, the Canto begins with an apostrophe to the reader's memory. Recall, reader, if ever in the mountain mist caught thee, for which thou couldst not see except as moles do through the skin. The, the difficulty of sight, the difficulty of seeing is, is highlighted again. How when the moist, dense vapors begin to disperse, the sun's disk passes feebly through them, and the imagination will quickly come to see how at first I saw the, su the sun again, now near its setting. So measuring mine with the faithful steps of my master, I came forth from such a fog to the beam which were already dead on the shores below. It's a twilight landscape. We have a number of uh, uh, reversals and contra antithesis. As you see, the mole, blind mole, that burrows in the, under the, the, the earth, and then the alpine scenery, uh, which makes vision also impossible. Dante is evoking the heights and the lowest possible point of sight with the mole. Uh, the sun is setting and the night is approaching. It is as if the whole, so the solidity of the world around him is vanishing, is disappearing. That's the experience that he's having. And this very moment, he's appealing to the memory of the reader and the imagination of the reader. It is as if that when the world outside seems to be failing us, we have this part of this inner light, this inner possibility of recollection of the world or imagining the world. Okay? Uh, he's specifying what some of the claims about the inner lights that he says we have within us could be. Uh, he had just said that. But also he's preparing this extraordinary second apostrophe to the imagination. Dante is, we are approaching the center of the, of, of, of the universe, this poetic universe, and Dante reminds us that this is a work of the imagination. Why does he do this? What is this? Uh, what does he say about the imagination? The first thing that he says about the imagination, oh, imagination, which so steals us at times from outward things that we pay no heed, though a thousand trumpets sound about us. Who moves thee if the senses offer thee nothing? It's the same question he had been asking earlier. Right? Where do, where do our, where do our choices come from? Where do, why, do, why do we do what we do? Is it because uh, uh, a power from the outside moves us? Or is there something that there is within us? Now this question is asked in, in slightly different terms, in terms of the imagination. The imagination is a power that, that's what he, um, he, he the way he describes it, that uh, describes it, that removes us from the outside world. Has the, there's such a power. In other words, it's not just the imagination that translates sensory experiences into images for the benefit of rational judgment. You know, this is the triadic Aristotelian order. What does the, the imagination is the middle ground between the senses, the work of the perception, and the work of reason, right? This is uh, a triadic pattern that Dante uh, could have found in Aquinas, who in turn found it certainly in Aristotle. That's the, the way it proceeds. He has another imagination that he's talking about now. An imagination that removes us from the outside world. It frees us that it needs nothing of um, the, the world of perception. It is a power that in many ways, that 
steals us from it. It's a power that, um, how does he describe it? It comes from the outward things that we pay no heed through a thousand trumpets sound about us. It's a, it's, a, it's a faculty that is completely free from the outside world, a power that we have within us to imagine worlds that don't even exist, to imagine things that without the solicitations of what lies uh, outside us and continues. Um, a light moves thee which takes form in the heavens either of itself or by will which directs it downwards of her impious deed. And then he goes on describing uh, three images of anger. At the point in which Dante is approaching the center of the, his world, we are, this, we, are, we are witnessing, we are shown the power of the imagination as a visionary faculty, as a faculty that is not a transcription of the real world. And that one wonders why he has to make this kind of claim. It's, it's, uh, it, it encompasses the real world, and yet something is something that almost prophetic, something that does not come from uh, 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 the contact with the world. Come back to this in a moment, I hope. Uh, he has three images then, three that come down to him gratuitously. They seem to have been descending into his mind without any, uh, anything that uh, uh, around him. And then Dante goes on uh, here describing the uh, law of um, purgatory. What is the world of purgatory? Um, what is the world of purgatory? How is it constructed? What is the architecture of this world? Unsurprisingly, this is a, like an, a fabric of love, an architecture of love, and it's at the very center lines, uh, uh, 91, 92 and 93, that this is the actual, numerically even, the center of the poem. Not surprising, that's what Dante says, neither creator nor creature, my son, was ever without love, either natural or of the mind. That's the center. What does he mean, natural of the mind? It's, he's distinguishing here between the two types of love, and in fact, he will clarify, and this is Danoas. The natural is always without error. Whatever impulse we may have, that's impulse of love, that is never um, prone to uh, sinfulness. It's a natural impulse, a natural desire. They are that which is uh, instead uh, sinful is the one, the one where choice is involved. The natural is always without error. The other may err through a wrong object or through excess or defect of vigor. So that whenever we make a choice, we may either not love the right object or we may love it too much or we may love it too little. And so this is the topography of purgatory this triadic division in terms of love. Everything is a problem of love, but then there are varieties that, that uh, uh, organizes its uh, uh, subdivisions. While it is directed on the primal good and on the secondary keep right measure, it cannot be the cause of sinful pleasure. When it is warped to evil, or with more with less concern, this due pursues its good against the creator with his creature. From this, thou canst understand that love must be the seed in you of every virtue and every action deserving punishment. Now, since love can never turn its face from the welfare of its subject, all things are secure from self-hatred uh, and, uh, and so on. And Dante now responds, ah, now I would have thee give thought to the other, uh, which pursues its good in faulty measure. Everyone confusedly apprehends a good in which the mind may be at rest and desires it, so that each strives to reach it, and if the love is sluggish, uh, that draws you to see or gain it. This terrors after due repentance torments you for, this, for that. Other good there is, etc. Um, so uh, the question then will become, and I did not ask you to uh, read this canto, but I can give you an, a, a, a sort of brief uh, preview of it. And that has to ask, um, if what is this love of choice? Um, does it depend, since, since I may have a particular perception of the world that makes me see whatever I encounter as beautiful and desirable, where is my fault? <coughs> he repeats the same problems that he had been raising in Canto 15. Uh, Dante will try to explain it in terms of love, and yet we are going to be brought back to 
the world of how do we perceive what it is that we love. Uh, uh, the perception of what we love becomes crucial to uh, our very responsibilities for it. So um, this is uh, uh, in, at the center of the poem. Then Dante seems to be suspended between two ideas. On the one hand, the, the, the notion that there is a real world where we have responsibilities for everything that uh, we do. Uh, and on the other hand, a world where there is an imagination which is completely disengaged from the world of reality. Uh, and and um, cannot be quite be uh, constrained or held in. So how are you going to suspend it between these two possibilities? How is Dante going to uh, bring them together? Do you see what the, the, the issue is? How do you, how do you uh, if, if the world of the imagination is free and disengaged from reality, then how am I going to, on the other hand, going to be held accountable for what I do of the world and with the world around me and with my own deeds? At the center of the poem, Dante is raising this contradiction, this not. Uh, imagination is made to be the way to knowledge. I can only know through the imagination. The imagination of that depends on my perception of the world or an imagination which frees me completely from the world. And then these two ideas of the imagination are really in contradiction one with the other. So where is the human responsibility? Um, the poem gets nourished by this duality of the imagination. The poem moves back and forth between one and the other. And let me just stop here because I think I I may have said a little bit too much about these issues, may, and I could respond to your questions, I hope, if there are some. Um, yes, sir. Please. Well, I don't know about that. The, 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 the question is really uh, a perplexity about what I have been, uh, yeah. what I have been saying. Uh, in Inferno, uh, will is crucial, and you are absolutely right. There cannot be a sin unless there is uh, a will involved. In Purgatorio, the argument here seems to be the, the, the way I've been following it from Kant to 15, 16, 17, and the way it's going to be developed in 18, and actually, frankly, 19, where Dante goes on telling a, a dream, uh, Dante makes the world of love uh, the, crucial, um, the, 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 the crucial act of our being in the world, relating us to God. We are related to God really from in, through the way of love, therefore the way of the heart, and not necessarily through some abstract metaphysical issues. Uh, but then the issue becomes, how is this love related to uh, the will. Is Dante being <coughs> uncertain between the two? What is, what, is, what is the moral? Dante begins in Canto 15 talking about moral responsibilities, this kind of free subjection that we have, and an inner light that is available to us. Uh, then he, Canto uh, 16, he will also talk about, the, the, in Canto 16, he talks about creation, the creation of the soul, the freedom which, uh, with which God creates, and that freedom authorizes us, uh, becomes a sort of ground for the human, human freedom. And then in uh, 17, first of all, he talks about an imagination which is completely free of any contact with the world. And then talks about this theory of love, that rational love that organizes, that f the love of uh, knowledge that organizes everything. I could just have stopped there and show you, okay, this is really what the text is, and, and maybe ask you to connect imagination and love, that um, are really the two sides of Canto 17 at the very center uh, of the poem, the, almost to imply that we can love only and so far as, and we can love as well as our imagination takes us to loving. That's clearly one of the, 
the, the images. But clearly there is more con in, uh, in, in that debate. Uh, the debate is that if I love according well or not enough or too much, that has to do with the way I perceive the world. So why does he have to talk about an imagination which is so unbounded that needs nothing of reality? And I'm interested in this subject, and I call it, well, I say, well, this is a visionary aspect of the imagination. It's a poet who thinks of himself as being the visionary poet. And, you know, you, you have an idea of romantic poets, for instance, uh, English romantic poets who distinguish between uh, fantasy and the imagination, though Dante does it in terms of uh, the, this imaginative power that removes me from the world of reality, takes me away, and opens up new spaces and, 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 and the mind in itself. I ask this question, though, from another point of view, which I think is connected to what we have been saying here. Can Dante ever write this kind of poem by being bound to the world of reality and to the way in which the real world is known? Clearly, the answer is no. The only way that Dante can come to God and the vision of God is by letting, uh, agreeing with this idea, yielding, surrendering to the, the power of the imagination that will take him out of the real world, right? You cannot really write a poem like the Divine Comedy by following rules and laws, uh, whether they are rhetorical or whether they are just pure ideas of style. You try to, you have to go on imagining things that don't really are available to our perceptions. That, to me, is the issue. That's how I have been moving this issue. And I think that the poem, that Dante's voice, is suspended between these two possibilities of the imagination. An imagination that has to accept the world of reality, an ordinary imagination, and yet there is also another idea of the imagination which is so much more powerful. But if we accept this as being true for the poem, it follows we have to ask the question of, what about the moral life? Is the moral life then one that well, Dante is saying that in effect all uh, uh, the language of uh, blame and praise, which depends on uh, accepting limits and free subjection to, to rules, uh, is, that, is he saying that that is also uh, maybe is arbitrary, that there may be some other law that he has to discover. And I don't think that there is yet an answer here. But that's the problem that I was trying to, to convey. Uh, was that, does that answer your provisionally, your, comp your, your perplexities? Okay. Um, yes. Well, uh, the, uh, the, the question is, uh, does the, the scene of anger in Canto 16, is, is that a kind of uh, polar opposite to love? And why does he begin with and that? And why does he begin with that? That's right. Well, I think that anger, I would define it as a form of madness to, to begin with. It is a kind of uh, eclipse <coughs> of, of all rationality. And so it explains why Dante will have to go on retrieving the laws of reason, the laws of rationality, to be opposed to the kind of, to that, that, uh, the experience of madness in Canto, in Canto 16. And we go into Canto 17, and he's talking about a sort of uh, love uh, which is very rational. But then he is undoing it with a, something that stands between madness and, and love, and that's the imagination. See the, the connection, okay. Um, I'm a little confused about what you just said about how the moral life might present a barrier to the imagination. And I'm, I, I just think if, what I've been understanding from what you've been saying about why you have <coughs> the imagination is because you're approaching it from this space, so it's hard to um, use the real world in which you approach it. So it seems like I'm supposed to use the imagination, which I guess is Dante's going to God. You know, he's approaching mystery, so it's hard for him to talk about this in a more rational way. But isn't that more of like an acknowledgement of his limitation than a transgression? So doesn't it still like fit with humility and fit with the moral law? I don't know. Uh, the, 
that, that's an excellent point. You don't only ask the question, I think that you, you are clarifying some of the, 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 the problems. Uh, the question is still about the, the whole issue of the imagination that, uh, uh, yes, on the, on the one hand, the imagination seems to be the way to so large and so such a force that will take Dante, I'm paraphrasing your point, take Dante all the way to, to see God. And I seem to be saying that that is a kind of transgression, but, it, but you, uh, f you emphasize that that can be an acknowledgement of human uh, limitations. Uh, I, ca I call it, um, uh, maybe that's true, that's really what it is. It's, uh, uh, I call that a visionary power within him. It may be coming to him from the outside. He asks that question. Does this visionary power come to me from the outside, or is it something that is within human beings? That's the answer. That's the question. He doesn't answer that question at that, at that point. What he does say is, well, this is the images that came to me, the image of Amata who committed suicide, uh, the image of Ahasuerus, and so on. He goes on with the th his three, three, uh, three images. Uh, he doesn't answer that directly. And I think that yeah, he wants to keep you guessing if this is a human transgression uh, rather than or an acknowledgement of uh, human limits. He, I don't think that he knows yet at this point what the, the uh, unfolding uh, of that dilemma will be. He wants us to think in terms of that dilemma. And that dilemma is at the heart of purgatory. Um, the dilemma between what, what, is, what is this power? Uh, I have a power within me that without which I can never really go to God. And is this in any way a transgression? Do I need a transgression in order to come to God? Um, Ulysses thought that there would be knowledge, no knowledge without transgression. Maybe Adam in the garden also thought that there would be no knowledge without transgression, that the real knowledge is to transgress. Is Dante thinking that way? That, or maybe he's thinking that there is no transgression without, at the same time, a sense of limitations. That indeed, that the idea of transgression depends on some sense of limitations. Do you see what I'm saying? What the argument seems to me could very well be. That in effect, uh, pride and humility <laughs> are really more connected than uh, what we like to think. Oh, so. You know, we are always proud, you know, um, and, and Dante would say it's good. To me, that's what Canto 10, 11, and 12 was saying. You may not agree with that reading, that pride is good in the measure in which I can reach out for something really higher. That's not bad. That's not bad. What is bad is that that blinds me to something else. It's, I, th I take that to be Franciscan thinking. He, he is invoking the, the humblest voice of uh, the whole uh, literary tradition uh, up to his time, the, the canticle of all creatures. Um, so, but I'm glad that you are giving me the opportunity to refocus on the fact that that dilemma between pride and humility reappears as a question of limits and transgressions with imagination and knowledge and with love, and with love. Of course, Dante would say, that there is such a thing of love within with laws. And yet love is one of those experiences where we usually don't like to believe that there are limits, right? Uh, oh, you know, uh, you don't want anybody to come, I hope, you, you, uh, to come to your door and say, I love you in a very reasonable way and with a lot of limitations. I'm sure you, you'll kick him <laughs> in the, <laughs> it's behind us, out. Uh, you know, we, love is one of those experiences exactly like the imagination, that the powers of which seem always to be transgressing whatever limitations we want to, we want it to transgress the limitations that ra rationally, reasonably, we want to impose on it. This is the question that Dante is raising. You, but you cannot have, I think that you are, you are onto the right track with your, your, in your paraphrasing the whole, uh, in, your, in your asking the question that maybe 
transgression and limitations really have to be seen together. Pride and humility will have to be seen together. Subjection and freedom will be, have to be seen together. They are not, they are not terms which are, which are so far apart from each other. Each involves the other, okay? That's, that's what I call it the paradox, the knot that joins these things together uh, is exactly that. Is this, am I, did I confuse all of you today here? Oh my, oh, then uh, I will confuse you next time. Okay, uh, other questions that we have? Yes. Ten to fifteen. Yes. The, yeah, this is uh, around line uh, 75 road, right? Mm -hmm. uh, let me just read this paragraph. The Dante is in the describing the virtue uh, that is opposed to envy, mercy, the idea of uh, the notion of mercy. And uh, uh, because, so I read from 65, because thou still settest thy mind on earthly things, Um, thou gatherest darkness from the very light. <coughs> ah, that's, that's part of uh, sort of reversals that we, how light induces and generates darkness. There's a certain kind of light we seem to believe or to think in terms of uh, the light that is available to us, but that does not necessarily produce more light, but can, can, can dim our understanding. Uh, about the, the way things really are. Uh, that infinite and unspeakable good, f which is there above, speeds to love as a sunbeam comes to a bright body. So much it gives of itself as it finds of other. So that the more charity extends, the more does the eternal goodness increase upon it. And the more souls that are enamored there above, the more there are so to be rightly loved, and the more love there is, and like a mirror, the one returns it to the other. And if my speech do not relieve the hunger that shall s thou shall see Beatrice and she will deliver thee wholly from this and every other craving. Strive only that soon may be raised as the other two are already the five wounds which are healed by being, uh, uh, by being painful. So the question is, you want me to say something about the mirror, the image of the mirror, the that is, is uh, being used here. The, okay, uh, I think that this is a platonic image of uh, the platonic image of uh, uh, the, the, the notion that all of uh, creation, this is the celestial hierarchy of the pseudo Dionysius. I don't know that I have ever spoken of him. I will, because Dante mentions him in paradise. But in the celestial hierarchy, Dante, th uh, the pseudo Dionysius, thinks of all creation being a kind of uh, all creation uh, being a, a kind of uh, uh, hall of mirrors, where everything is reflected on uh, to uh, the other. The, a number of uh, 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 reflections uh, that all uh, give different light, the, the, in different ways, the light of God. This is so. That's where this, the problem of mercy. Uh, places us, so this whole, the idea of charity. Dante is interested in two things. One, the generative idea of charity. Charity produces more charity. It has a kind of uh, uh, power to generate itself and multiply itself. And the way he compares this is, uh, and he compares it to what I call, what he calls here obliquely, the whole of mirrors. Um, let me just say something else about the pseudo Dionysus. When the pseudo Dionysus wants to mystical theology, he wants to talk about the divine. 
he will think about the divine in terms of light, as you know. Light that is ref refracted and reflected throughout the, the orders and ranks of creation. Um, the highest image of this light of the divine is the sun. The sun that is generous in the sense, as I mean generous in a very peculiar sense, in the sense that it gives itself to all without any distinction. And it uh, depends on us whether we are going to be able to appreciate that light or not. But the sun is giving itself freely to all. This is the principle of mercy for Dante. Mirrors are reproducing that light endlessly. The whole of creation is sending back this kind of light without any loss in itself of uh, the original light. This is the metaphor and the metaphysics of mirror in Dante. Uh, the world is therefore from the point of view of mercy and not from the point of view of envy where we do not even see the light. Right? <coughs> envy is that it means that we have no knowledge of anything that comes from the, uh, from the outside but in the world of mercy we have uh, an idea, we, ha we understand this generous giving of the light which, come, which comes from God uh, and the heat that goes with it. Uh, that's it. So. It's, 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 uh, it's a virtue that completely offsets the notion of, uh, um, of envy. The idea, God who creates without envy. That's another way of thinking about, about uh, the generosity of God. And that is connected to the, the light and to the multiplications of the light through mirrors. Okay. Actually, uh, this is an image that really reappears in paradise and we'll come back to this, uh, this canto, uh, the whole of paradise organized through this, uh, uh, through this, this whole, this infinite reflections uh, of, uh, of, the, of, 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 of God's light. Other questions? Okay, well, next time, uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>